Good morning, congregation. We see change throughout our life. Change can be a positive thing. Let's welcome Darren in our family. This is our, this is his He's our new congregation worship leader. Let's go. And we can thank you all for our previous person is here today. Thank you, Joe. You're not lost. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive. All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and i ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day Now your mercy I say my soul And now your freedom is all that I know The old man knew Jesus when I met you You called my name and I ran of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day I needed rescue, my sin was heavy My chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Cause when you call my name, I ran out of that place Out of the darkness into your glorious day You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. 
who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King of all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. spoke a word you were singing over me you've been so so good to me for I took a breath you breathed your life in me you've been so so kind Love of 
God. Oh, it chases me down fights till I'm found, leaves a ninety-nine. Oh, I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Loving God, we are grateful for your presence with us this morning. You are the creator of all, and you give us life yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Lord, we come to you with our humble heart, and we want to hear your voice, and we want to be filled 
with your Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, we are here with a variety of worries and concerns, and you know what we have. Some of them are overwhelming because it seems like they are too big for us. And we find ourselves small and powerless within the issues. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, we ask for your help and your guidance in our lives. And we ask you to pour out your grace to those who are going through the challenging time. Lord, we want to lift to you all our concerns and issues in silence. Lord, we come to you with our humble heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Loving God, we thank you for listening to our prayers, and we thank you for your comforting hands. Loving Father, help us to reach out to our neighbors with the love of Christ. Let us be kind and helpful to our families, to our families, friends, co-workers, and neighbors. Help us spread the love of Christ to the people we meet and the places we go. Guide to treat others in love and care, but with no judgment, but with no arrogant heart. Help us love others as Jesus loved us. As we get into the summer, we pause all the Sunday schools and small groups. We thank you for all the leaders and teachers who served your people and your church. Oh God bless them and keep them healthy and help them keep up the good work in this body of Christ. Lord God, this is the season all things in nature grow just like that we want to grow spiritually day by day lord we pray for the uh, youth group and those going uh, to the youth camp this summer bless them to meet you personally and help them experience of your grace at the camp as the body of christ let us keep praying for our youth group and also for the children and also for young adults. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit fill this place and our hearts as we listen to the message passage that prepared for us and open our hearts and minds to receive your word for us. Lord, we thank you for your love and grace for us. Gracious God, now we come to you with the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we have a, another baptism this week, and uh, this uh, happened on a Wednesday night. Sometimes um, as I'm around Megan, uh, I'll hear our teenagers say, you know, do we have church this week? And they're not talking about 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Um, they're asking, are we going to have church on Wednesday night? And so this baptism actually happened on a Wednesday night, and uh, Megan's going to share a little bit later about uh, how we ended up at a lake, uh, but they wanted to be immersed, and so we had to go where there was a little more water, and um, one of our students, and then also one of our adult helpers. Uh, Anna is the adult, and um, if, Anna, if you're watching on the camera, we just want to say um, we're glad that we get to share this moment with you. Uh, she was not able to be here this morning. Um, 
she was a part of the adult team when the student said, I, I want to do this, and so she said, can I get baptized too? Uh, two years ago, Anna and her husband Noah moved here from Tennessee, and this weekend dropped in on us and um, just kind of adopted us as their new church, and um, it's been a delight to um, see them both growing and um, see her step of faith, and so... Um, this last month, she made her commitment to Christ in a public way, and so baptism happened. And, and she and, and the student both have a black shirt on that says, I have decided. Did it say on the back? Or no, just, it was just for us, I have decided to follow Jesus. And so a, 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 the conversation isn't real clear. Pastor Jay was videoing from the, the safety of the beach. Um, so with the phone you know, 20 feet away, um, it doesn't quite catch all of it, but I start out just saying, how do we come to this decision, looking at their shirts, and uh, each of them kind of responds a little bit, and, and I'm going to have Megan share it after you see it, um, the, the story for our teenager. Um, but the, the part for Anna was, uh, she said, I decided to do this tonight because we're moving tomorrow. And I didn't know that, and so there's a little bit of like, ah, oh, you know, and you just got here. <laughs> but um, they moved back to Tennessee, and so they're one of the benefits of the stream. Um, they got to, to be a part of worship today, even though they're not here in, in-house. Um, she and her husband are watching us online. So let's play the video and let you see that. So as Pastor Jeff was saying, I, I do get a blessing of being able to share um, our students' journey. It happened a year ago. This student went to camp, um, Summer Games University camp, um, had a wonderful experience, met Jesus there, and um, was inspired and came back and said, Miss Megan, I want to be baptized. Can I get baptized? And of course, Pastor Jeff and I were like, yes, 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 you can, absolutely. Um, and it took us a year to have these conversations, to be able to schedule that, and, and to really know um, that in her heart, that is really what she was doing, and it wasn't just that she had this mountaintop experience at camp and, and was feeling that, which is awesome, but it was also sparked and then fueled the whole year, which was absolutely beautiful. Um, so then we did get to baptize her. Over, one of our, our activities over spring break was we went to a movie. And at this movie, there's a scene of baptism. And um, they went to a lake. <laughs> and Mercedes was watching this, watching this movie and just watching everything happen. Um, in this scene, this, this individual was baptized and came up and out of the water. And she's like, I, I watched that. And they just looked so refreshed. I want that. I want to be refreshed. 
And um, so that was kind of her story. She wanted to, that was what baptism meant to her, was that she wanted to be refreshed. And, um, and I can tell you that she loves Jesus with her whole heart and that she's claimed Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And that's amazing. That's beautiful. Um, part of that then experience that we got to do at the lake was um, we got to inspire the students that came and, um, and witnessed that baptism. And it was announced that maybe this is a step that you want to take. Um, and three students that night at the lake said, I want to be baptized too. What do I need to do to be baptized? Um, and we had talked about that a little bit. And we said, well, you need to have three conversations with, um, with myself, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Jay, um, so that you would truly understand that this is a commitment and what that looks like. Um, and three students at the lake came up and said, Miss Megan, <laughs> I want to talk about it. What does that look like? What does that mean? And, um, and it was really a, a beautiful, special night. So, yeah. So I, I left the beach. Um, they had an hour to play. And I'm like, okay. The, and so they're in good hands with Megan and the other adults. And, and so the next morning, Megan's like, where did you go? You know, you <laughs> left me all alone. I'm like, all alone. We were 20 people. And uh, there are three people want to get baptized. And and so she spent till like 9.30 uh, that night um, having those conversations uh, with the, the next group that wants to do the same. And um, so as a Methodist church, we, we offer different amounts of water, if you will. We, often you see someone sprinkled uh, here in, in the sanctuary. Um, you could also be poured. We would probably need to modify, add some towels or something, but if you wanna be immersed, um, we either have to go across the street to a church that has a tank uh, that you do that in the sanctuary or go to a lake or a river. And we found a lake where we could do that. So baptism doesn't happen outside of the congregation. Uh, as, as United Methodists, we, we try to say, you know, it, it puts you in relationship with Jesus Christ and also with a congregation. So the liturgy that we end with uh, when someone uh, takes that step of faith has this question for you. And so I have shared this uh, story with all three uh, congregations, the worship times this weekend, and, and just to, to bring these two into kind of your awareness, I ask this group, will you pray for these two? Will you encourage them through your prayers that whether they're here or, or whether they're in Tennessee, um, we can support them. If so, answer, I will. So Mercedes and Anna, um, we just would pray God's blessing on you um, in your journey as followers of Christ. Thank you. So we're full of celebrations this morning. We got to celebrate something that started our summer as baptism. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to celebrate what just happened here a couple weeks ago um, through our Vacation Bible School. So we're going to show a video of some highlights from our children's ministry um, celebrations. Probably, yes. 
I was probably a little too excited that I did not get the green slime on me <laughs> in that video. Um, that represented our kids raised over $200 worth of change. That's just the quarters and the change um, in order to donate to our families who have been displaced by the apartment collapse. So um, we said that if we could raise $100 of change, that we would be slimed. And, um, and they raised $200. And I didn't have to be slimed, thanks to Pastor Jay. <laughs> So that was wonderful. Um, at this time, we're going to have our children's moment. So any kids, come on forward. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I'm not that intimidating, I promise. <laughs> Good morning. Yay. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I have something fun to talk about. Have you been to fireworks this year? Have you seen fireworks? Yep. It's 4th of July weekend. Well, we're celebrating all the 4th of July weekend stuff. This weekend, have you seen fireworks? You can hear them. Oh, I'm sorry that they scare you. Open the door, and then like three big pops went off, and I jumped, and I slammed myself into the door. Well, that sounds a little painful. I'm sorry that that experience happened to you. Do you like fireworks? Yeah. Boom. What are your favorite? <laughs> She's like, I don't know what fireworks are. Um, <laughs> what are your favorite kind of fireworks? Just fireworks in general? Okay. So, I have a tradition in my family that we go and we watch these fireworks and we name, we say, oh, this one's for Grandpa. Oh, this one's for Abby. Oh, this one's for Megan. And we name the fireworks. And many times these fireworks represent, like they'll show different colors or um, things that are our favorite things. My favorite, very most favorite firework is the one that lights and it's not very loud, but it's like a willow tree, and it shines the whole sky up. Lots and lots of lights. So it has a bunch of colors. Now we talk about fireworks, not only because it's July 4th weekend, but because it kind of represents something that we talked about in Vacation Bible School, and hopefully we remember throughout the year. Do you remember what the phrase was at the end of Vacation Bible School? No, the end phrase of the like power phrase. We would say, when life is hard. Shine Jesus light. Shine Jesus light. That's right. So we would get up and we'd say, shine Jesus light. It's a lot like those fireworks that happen in the sky. They're loud sometimes, but they also are beautiful and they shine Jesus light and they fill the sky. So as we go out this holiday in two days, um, we can look at those fireworks as a reminder to shine Jesus' light, to be as big as those fireworks and shine Jesus' light, because this world needs some big fireworks shining at them, right? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the reminders that you are everywhere, that you are here with us today, and that you are in this world um, ready to shine your light, to share your love and to um, inspire. So God, we thank you for the fireworks that remind us of that. And we thank you for your love for us and the reminder to shine your light always, each and every day. I thank you so much for these kiddos and the way that they do shine here in this congregation. And I know that they um, shine just by being them. So thank you so much for bringing kids to us and to this world. And it's in your precious and holy and loving name that we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to stand up. And we're going to look at that camera right there, and we're going to give a big air high five because what? Because we're all in this together. We're all in this together. On the count of three, we'll do one, two, three, air high five. Have a blessed week, everybody. Well, I, I wanted to pour the slime onto Megan's, but Pastor Rob didn't. <laughs> All right, uh, today's scripture is from Exodus chapter 12, uh, verses 11 through 23. 
This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh day, must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and another one on the seventh day. Do not work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Celebrate the festi festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your families out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses. And anyone, whether a foreigner or native born, who eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top on the both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. The word of God for the people of God. So this uh, is a, a weekend that uh, we celebrate our freedom as a country. July 4th is our Freedom Day as uh, citizens in the United States. Passover has that element within this tradition as well. For the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt, and the Passover was kind of the triggering event that opened the door for their freedom. I would like us to think about, to consider just um, freedom for them wasn't just now we can go anywhere we want and do anything we want, but it came with an invitation. Moses delivered the invitation over and over and over. We are now free to be in relationship with God. We are now free to go and to worship our God in the wilderness and that was the invitation that kind of started the whole process of the, the plagues that came down upon Egypt. The king was reluctant to let them go. Moses declared, God wants them to be free. And freedom wasn't just an open-ended um, invitation. It was inviting them into a relationship with God. How do we use our freedom because we have that same invitation. Uh, we're free to do anything, but not all things are a blessing to ourselves or to our neighbors. Will we use our freedom in relationship to God to practice our faith, to worship the God above all? Uh, I think it's very interesting that many Christian practices have connections to Jewish traditions. Jesus didn't just come onto the scene and, and, and initiate a brand new thing. Jesus was a, a master builder. He was building a, a spiritual house that had a foundation that connected with what had been in the past, that, that Jesus connected with what God had been doing for thousands of years in the world. He came as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Jesus was a Jewish Messiah. The first believers were all Jews. And then as the message went out from Jerusalem and Judea, 
other people began to say, I want a relationship with God. And, and so it spread beyond the Jewish faith, but it started there. Jesus was born into a Jewish family to connect with what God had done in the past. Jesus was the embodiment of all the Old Testament hopes and dreams. The Israelites had longed for a Messiah, a deliverer, for hundreds and hundreds of years. So the last several weeks, we've been actually working our way backwards through several chapters of Exodus, uh, I would say key elements uh, of our faith history. The first week, I recalled how uh, once they were delivered from slavery, the, the Hebrews found themselves out in the wilderness, and, and they ran out of food. And their question was, how are we going to survive now? And, and God blessed them with daily bread. And for 40 years, they had what they called manna every morning. And I suggested that when Jesus first taught the Lord's Prayer, that phrase, give us this day our daily bread, wasn't without some connection to their history. Everybody say daily bread. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say daily bread. And I think that connects all the way back. The, the Hebrews, every morning, they went out and said, thank you, God, for this daily bread. The manna was a gift of God. It was bread from heaven bread from heaven. Last week, then we looked at uh, another segment of the story there in Egypt, and, and we observed a, a pattern of behavior. There was a, a, a whole committee within the, the Hebrew people that were kind of stuck in the gear of complain, complain, complain. Whenever things didn't go to their liking, they would complain. When they ran out of food, they complained. When they ran out of water, they complained. When they had a hard day, they complained. When they were now, we're sick and tired of following this Moses, they complained, and God was testing them. Are, are you going to follow me only on the good days, or are you going to follow me through all of life? And so today we come uh, to the, maybe the kickoff for this story. One of the major building blocks of our faith, we, we have baptism and communion, our, our sacraments, and yet baptism and communion didn't just appear out of nowhere. There's a context, and there's also some connections with this part of the story here in Exodus. Jesus didn't invent communion from nothing. He took some familiar elements of the Passover tradition. Jesus and the 12 disciples were in the middle of the Seder meal, and at the end of that meal... There, there was a, a sequence of cups of wine, and when he took the last cup, instead of saying what he was supposed to say, Jesus changed the words. And he said, this cup contains my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. That was a little bit of a surprise to the disciples. He took the bread that was on the table, and he said, this bread represents my body, which will be broken for you. It hadn't happened yet. This was the day before he was crucified. When we talked about baptism, I said that you can be sprinkled or poured or immersed. Sometimes uh, when we uh, have traditions that overlap within the Christian family, um, it's not uncommon for a Methodist to have a, a neighbor that says, oh, you're, you weren't really baptized. You know, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible you know, and they kind of use that word loosely. The Bible doesn't say anything about sprinkling to be baptized. I would want to reach back a little bit that um, I, I think that if you are baptized by sprinkling, what did Moses say at the Passover? Take the hyssop, sprinkle the blood on the doorpost. And that was how they were saved. The angel of death passed over the sign of faith that sprinkling has a connection with the Old Testament, maybe not the New. The New Testament doesn't, never, doesn't ever say how much water to apply. And, and if you really want to look at church history in the desert, uh, the desert fathers said you have to have at least three drops, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you live in a desert 
and, and you don't even have water for cleansing or bathing, uh, it's very precious. Their, their sacrament observance um, was adjusted for life in the wilderness, in the desert. The context for the first Passover meal is this. Moses is delivering the judgments of God against Pharaoh. Each judgment was a plague against Egypt, painful for the people of Egypt, visible by the people of God. Each plague seemed to kind of notch up the severity of the judgment that God was delivering because Pharaoh kept saying, no, you cannot leave. No, you cannot go out into the wilderness to worship. And so Moses said, okay, you're going to suffer. Your people are going to feel the weight of God's judgment. One way to understand what happens in those ten plagues is uh, it was like a contest between uh, the gods of Egypt and the God of Israel. The gods of Egypt were many. The God of Israel was one, the Lord God above all gods. The Egyptians are very spiritual, and unless you, we look down on them and say, oh, this is ancient and magical and superstitious and all, um, they, they had a, a pretty widespread of idols or uh, gods and goddesses, and, and they kind of worked like this. You know, we tried to appease this God to get what we want. And, and when it comes to the weather, you know, we try to appease this God to get enough rain. We try to appease this God to have enough children, this God to have enough to eat. Today, I, I see elements of that are just basic to human nature. Christians sometimes say, well, gee, I, my family's in a crisis. I really need God's help. I'll put a check in the offering. My kids are really in a painful season. Uh, I really need God's help. I'll go to church every Sunday. You know, we make deals, and, and in one sense, it's almost like we treat God as a vending machine. You put in a prayer, you get what you want. We are not all that different from the Egyptians. God invites us to trust. God asks, invites us to ask. Um, and sometimes there is a blessing, sometimes there's a direct response to our prayers, but sometimes it's just hard, and God still invites us to trust. So we have this contest between Moses and Pharaoh, between the, the many gods of Egypt and the one God of Israel. And it begins as Moses appears before the king and says, let my people go, our God has asked us to go worship in the wilderness, and, and it was just to, to leave for the weekend. That's what Moses started with. We're going to go worship in the, in the wilderness for three days. And the, the Pharaoh said, I don't think so. And he's kind of turned to his advisors and said, I don't know what kind of game uh, Moses is playing, but the answer is no. Whatever he says, no. And so Moses says, fine, you will feel the weight of God's judgment. This river that you trust for your life is going to turn to blood. And Pharaoh said, I'd like to see that. And so Moses, you know, in the movies, what we see is he touched the water with his staff and the, the red spread. And the net result was uh, there was nothing to drink and all the fish died. The, the Egyptians had uh, so revered and depended upon the Nile River. I mean, all people lived by that as their source of water and life, and uh, animals depended upon it. The crops depended upon it. Uh, everybody depended upon the Nile River, and, and they kind of deified that, and they actually named the god Osiris. There was a personality and a, and a god and everything wrapped around their worship and dependence upon the river, and that day the river died. So it's the god of Israel, one, the God of Egypt, zero. And it began like that. There was a plague of frogs, a plague of gnats, and a plague of flies. And every time Moses went to the king, he said, will you let my people go? And the king said, are you kidding? No. And Moses went out, and, and a judgment began. Uh, it affected everybody, Israelites and Hebrews. They had to go through frogs and gnats and flies. And, um, and then it became a little more severe. The fifth plague, uh, Moses announces all the Egyptian cattle 
and camels and livestock, sheep and goats will get sick and some of them are going to die. And if you remember uh, the golden calf, that was their, their kind of their animal idol in the shape of a calf. When the Israelites got out into the wilderness and Moses went up on Mount Sinai and God gave him the Ten Commandments, he was gone for 40 days. And, and he was gone so long that the people on the ground began to wonder, maybe Moses got hit by lightning, maybe Moses isn't coming back, we've got to figure out who to follow. And, and so somebody took all the gold and shaped it into a calf, and they began to worship. You know, they're spiritual people. They picked that up from their neighbors back in Egypt. They said, well, um, maybe this is what we have to do. And so they worshiped the calf. They learned that from their Egyptian neighbors. The next plague announced by Moses, Pharaoh still says, no way, you're not going to go out of town, no. And so Moses says, okay. And the next plague, God makes a distinction between the Israelites and the Egyptians. It's a plague of boils, sores, painful sores upon our skin. And it was the first time that only the citizens of Egypt suffered they had two gods that this seemed to strike at. Isis. Anybody ever heard of Isis? Saturday morning cartoons. Isis was the goddess of health. Imenhop was the god of healing. And it's like the god of Israel took on those gods of Egypt. Moses then announces hail. Hail destroys the crops. Then there's a plague of locusts. Locusts eat whatever's left from the hail. And we come down to the ninth plague. And, and this one is also kind of familiar. Um, they had a name for the sun god, Ra. If you know a night at the museum, the sun goes down and all the critters in the museum start to move and, and the, the carsophagus with the tomb, you know, the body, you know, the casket starts to shake and, and this uh, personality kind of wakes up from the past and, and everybody's like, who are you? And he goes, I'm Ra. You know, it's funny and all that, but that, that was a part of their series of gods that they worshipped. They depended upon the Nile, and they gave that a divine personality. They depend upon sunlight for things to grow, and they, they gave that a, a personality, and they pictured it, and they made it into an idol. The god of light was the most powerful and the most revered of all the gods of Egypt, except for the king. Pharaoh himself was a god. God's power had been shown over and over and over. Pharaoh's heart was hardened over and over and over. And at each time, sometimes he gave in and then he would announce, I changed my mind. And each plague struck against Pharaoh's power. And it comes down to this last one. And for three days, the sun went out and fear and terror filled the hearts of the Egyptians. And then they came to the 10th plague. Pharaoh didn't want to talk to Moses anymore. He says, I, you know, I, I don't want to hear anything from you. And so Moses said, fine. And the last judgment was against uh, the people of Egypt. So the firstborn of every family and of all the livestock will die. The first chapter of Exodus began with uh, the Pharaoh killing all the baby boys, having them thrown into the river. God's judgment now falls upon Egypt for their crime. And the king's son would be one of those whose life was taken. Moses gave instructions of how people could be saved and avoid this plague. He was very specific on the menu. Um, the scripture that Pastor Day read had a lot to say about bread and yeast and unleavened bread and um, and that seemed to be something that was, was very important. And, and the, the factor of yeast in bread, you have to wait for the bread to rise. And, and Moses said, we're going to be in a hurry. We're going to be leaving tomorrow. And so your bread, we don't have time to let it rise. And so in the remembrance, the annual act, that was a part of their tradition, bread that's flat. And the lamb then, roasted lamb, was the main part of the menu. We observe that meal 
in Holy Week, we kind of have a, a Christian version of that and, and we just use the symbols, bitter herbs and everything it had a meaning tied to slavery and how hard their existence was in Egypt. Uh, but a, a Jewish Seder um, actually ends with a feast. The, the components of remembering what God has done in the past are completed and then the kitchen opens and all kinds of food come out. It's a celebration. It's their freedom celebration. It's a bright spot in their life. Moses finished his directions by saying, when you sacrifice the lamb, the blood is supposed to be sprinkled on the doorpost by the hyssop branch, the, the meal eaten with your shoes on and your staff in your hand. And then the angel of death would pass over each house that had the sign on the door. There are a number of parallels between Passover and communion. I end just with a, a couple here to consider. God gave the Hebrews historical markers to help them recall the important events of the past, to remind them of God's presence here and now. Jesus did the same for his disciples and for us when he took the bread and the cup and he said, I'm going to sacrifice my life. Jesus was the Lamb of God. For Passover, a lamb was slain, and the blood of the lamb provided deliverance from the angel of death. Jesus said, I am the Lamb of God. He was announced as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So as we think about our faith, if Jesus was a, a builder, master builder, and, and putting together a spiritual house, everything we have as followers of Christ rests on the foundation of what God did in the Old Testament for the Jewish nation, for the Jewish people, for the Hebrews. And it really starts to come together at Passover. I would invite Pastor Jay to come at this time, and we're going to prepare for the serving of communion. We have an open table. You don't have to be a member of our church to participate. If you are in need of God's grace and mercy, um, it is open for you to come this morning. We remember how Jesus, on the night before he died on the cross, took the, the bread and he broke it and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body broken for you. And then after the supper, he took a cup and he, he blessed it and he, as he passed it among his disciples, he said, this cup contains my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. We do this in remembrance of him. I would invite you to come down these two um, aisles, and Pastor Jay will be on one side and I'll be on the other. Our partners are going to come and help us, and we'll tear a piece of the bread off and place it in your hand, and then if you can touch the bread to the cup. Uh, if you would rather not do intinction, there are some uh, elements in a basket at both exits here at the front, and if the musicians would come to receive first, and after you've received, you can spend a moment in prayer at the railing.
to send you out now with um, just the blessing of God that we've uh, eaten together at the Lord's table. May your faith be strengthened. May you be led by the Holy Spirit. May you be a follower of Jesus as you use your freedom to include faith this week. I want to end just with a, a word of thanks to Darren. Um, thank you for agreeing to be our worship leader at this hour. And um, we just welcome you again and um, we go with God's blessing. Amen. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. 